As we mentioned earlier, we're going to bore our cylinder block 30 thousandths oversize. We found that more often than not, boring the block oversize is necessary to attain adequate cylinder condition for proper ring sealing and long engine life. In conjunction with boring the block oversize, we need to use a proper oversized piston and ring combination to fit this oversized bore. So due to the fact that we are going to replace our pistons, it is not necessary to inspect the condition of our old pistons. They will be replaced. However, we will reuse our connecting rods. So let's take a little closer look at them at this point. After removal of the connecting rod assemblies from the block, we want to inspect the condition of the area of the rod directly under the rod bearing. Looking closely at this area, we will see some light diagonal etchings. These are normal. They were made from the manufacturer of the connecting rods when they were final honed to dimension and size. There's also some discoloration under here, which is actually just a staining from contaminants in the oil that got between the back of the bearing and the connecting rod. Visually, this rod is in acceptable condition. Now we'll look at a connecting rod that had a bearing spun in it. Right off, we're going to notice we have deep linear scorings. We have a bluish discoloration right under the beam of the rod, which is from excessive heat. We'll also notice these little shiny areas. They are actually particles of the hard back of the bearing which have embedded themselves in the connecting rod material itself. This connecting rod must be reconditioned and must have the bolts replaced. Also, if the rod cannot be reconditioned because it's scored too badly, the entire rod must be replaced. But we also highly recommend that even a rod that visually looks good be checked for proper dimension and roundness and still recommend that the rod be reconditioned and new bolts be installed. Here is an example of the crankshaft end or the large end of a properly reconditioned connecting rod. If you notice we have a flat face going around the perimeter and on the back side of the rod we have a similar face. These are the thrust faces of the rod. One side of this rod will be up against a matching flange of the crankshaft and the other side will be up against the other connecting rod which are on a common journal. These surfaces must be smooth and flat and free of any protrusions. Looking at the bearing face of the rod, we will notice that we have crisscrossing hone marks which were made during the reconditioning process when it was honed to proper dimension and trueness. If we look closely here, we'll see a very fine line which runs across the width of this area. That's the actual parting line between the rod and the rod cap. If everything was done correctly and we run an object across this line, we shouldn't feel any roughness or any projection because they should be in identical planes. This rod can now have the piston attached to it and be reassembled in our engine. Piston and rod assembly. The most important thing to look at at this point is going to be the fit of the wrist pin in the piston. To check that is very simple. If you hold the piston in this attitude, and with one finger gently lift up on the rod, it should move up and down with absolutely no binding or resistance. This tells us that we have a nice fit in between these parts. Now, let's also look underneath the piston. We want to check for wrist pin centering. If we move the rod back and forth between the, the pin boss and then center it, we can, we can check for the centering of the wrist pin. At this point, with the rod centered between the bosses, let's take a look at the outside edge of the pin. Looking at the depth of the pin from the face of the piston, and then looking at the same location on the opposite side of the piston, we're going to compare the depth of the pin to the piston skirt. If they're within a sixteenth of an inch of the same depth, we have a good installation. If it's more than this difference, we should take the piston back to the machine shop and request them to recenter the pin. On our assembly, 
we had opted to use the aftermarket rod bolts, which ensure us of a much stronger combination and better engine life. Traditionally, the cast pistons are measured 90 degrees from the center line at the bottom of the skirt. The forged pistons, however, are measured 90 degrees to the center line of the pin. To show that a little more clearly, the cast piston will be measured at the bottom of the skirt, perpendicular to the pin, whereas a forged piston will be measured perpendicular to the pin, but at the center line of the pin, which will be much higher up on the skirt. We need to know this so that, depending on which piston we use, we can accurately determine our piston-to-wall clearance in the cylinder block. For final assembly, we want to check our piston-to-wall clearance. Piston-to-wall clearance is simply the difference between the diameter of the piston measured at the manufacturer's recommended points with the maximum dimension of our cylinder. It's very simple to do this. First, you want to put a light coating of oil in the cylinder to be measured. You want to coat the cylinder all the way around. Then what we want to do is take a standard set of feeler gauges. Now looking back to our manufacturer's chart, First, we want to find out what the minimum clearance is for our actual piston. In our case, these pistons are recommended at a minimum of 4 thousandths clearance. So starting with a 4 thousandths feeler gauge, we're going to take our piston, and if you notice a piston, we've marked it number 7. That's because this piston is on rod number 7. If you recall, we marked them when we took the engine apart. What we want to do is make sure that this assembly goes back in cylinder number 7, and consequently, all other pistons wind up in their corresponding cylinders and are checked in those bores. So now that we've reconfirmed our relationship of piston to cylinder combination, we want to take our 4 thousandths gauge, lay it alongside of our piston, insert the piston and gauge together in the cylinder. By installing both the gauge and the piston in the cylinder simultaneously and moving the piston in, We'll notice in our case that the piston moves very freely with no binding. At this point, we know we have at least achieved proper minimum piston wall clearance. If you experience binding with the minimum recommended clearance, the cylinder should be honed out to attain at least minimum clearance. Now we're going to try a 5 thousandths gauge. Once again, we repeat the, repeat the procedure. Putting the gauge along the skirt, we insert the gauge and the piston together. We notice now that we have some resistance to the piston moving in and out with the gauge in place. However, it's still moving smoothly. There is actually no binding, just mild resistance. Now we're inserting with a 6 thousandths gauge, and we find that the piston actually wants to bind and lock up. We know now that the piston is set at 5 thousandths piston to wall clearance. Once again, we want to repeat this process with all cylinders and pistons, making sure that we have the proper piston in its related bore. To find out what your, your piston, your ring gap is, what we'll have to do is put a ring, physically put a ring in the finished bore and put it in squarely and measure it with a feeler gauge. To do this is very simple. You take your ring, bring it together, and insert it sideways into the bore about a quarter of an inch down. Then, just pivot the ring until it started in the bore. Now, to be able to measure this accurately, we have to get this ring equidistant from the deck all the way around to keep it square in the bore. To do that, it's simple. You just take an old flat top piston that'll fit the bore, Take an old ring, put it in the lower groove to act as a stop, a depth stop. Just take the top of the piston, put it in backwards, push it down till you've hit your old ring, and you're square on the bore, equidistant from the top, and now you can accurately check the ring gap. To do that, we just use a feeler gauge, and you start out with any size that looks about right and you start putting it in the gap. Okay, now we found a, a gauge that fits in here, and we have 18 thousandths, which is too much. Typically, rule of thumb is 
you want three thousandths to four thousandths end gap per inch of cylinder bore. This is a four inch bore plus thirty thousandths. The ring we've put in here is a thirty thousandths oversized ring. Typically the ring manufacturers will give you excess end gap in a ring for a given bore than you normally would require. The problem is at eighteen thousandths gap this would be the condition of an engine that might already have forty or fifty thousand miles on it. We'd like to do better than that. So the way you do better is we use what we call a five over ring or a hand fit ring. And a ring is going to look just like your other ring did. However, it's made so that until the bore is at thirty-five thousandths, you're still going to have zero end gap. So what we're going to have to do is machine the ring and continually check it until we have the proper fit that we want. At this point, this ring, when inserted in the bore like the, the other ring was, we won't even be able to get it in. We won't be able to get it sitting square in the bore because now it's too big. So we, ha we have to increase the gap even to start checking it. You take the ring, you insert it into the tool, and by pushing forward on it and squeezing the ring in a little bit, it'll line up in the cutter. Then by moving it side to side, you just eyeball until the ring is in line on the, on the cutting wheel. Okay, now you want to turn the crank it so that the cutter cuts from the outer face of the ring to the inner face. And it even says right on top of the cutter which direction to rotate it in. By doing it that way, you never burr the face of the ring that contacts the cylinder wall. Now that we've opened it up a little bit, we'll try it again, see if we can, we have any gap at all now. See if we can start measuring anything. Eventually, we get the fit we want. We're on a six now, so we remove one thousandth. We've got to go a little more than that. We want to get ten on this ring. Eventually, you get the feel of how much you can take off or how many turns of the file with how much pressure on it the point where you can move at a faster rate. It just all comes with time. So we'll go up to our 10 now, and, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah, there we are. We're at 10. Okay, just fit snugly. You have to just push it down, and it'll fit snugly. When you have that snug fit, that's what you want. Now, at this point, you have to deburr the ring. After you file the ring, there's going, to, there's going to be a slight burr on the top and bottom faces of the ring. To remove them, take a fine stone, place it at an angle about 45 degrees to the top and bottom face of the ring. Using a, stroke, a drawing motion from the outside edge, which contacts the cylinder wall, to the inside of the ring, draw back with light pressure, just lightly a few strokes until the burr is gone. Now that we've finished setting the gap on the bottom ring, we'll proceed to set the gap on the top ring. Once again, we've set the, the gap on the bottom ring at 10 thousandths. The top ring we're going to set at 12 thousandths. The lower rings you can set a little bit tighter and get a little better seal than the top rings. And to do the top ring, it's the exact same procedure as the bottom ring, with the exception that we're going to make it 2 thousandths larger on the gap than we did on the previous ring. Other than that, the whole procedure is identical. A note on the oil rings on a set of the 5,000 silver rings. The ring is already dimensioned for the bore. You do not have to machine or modify the oil rings. They just go in the way they come. Now we're going to install the rings on the piston. To do that, it helps to secure the piston firmly in a vise so that you don't have to fight the piston moving from you because the rings are fairly delicate you don't want to twist them or break them what we usually do we just take a vise place a rag in it to protect against any scratches on the connecting rod put the connecting rod in the vise draw it together so it just touches against the rod now drop the piston down so the bottom of the skirt contacts the top of the vise but will not be clamped by it then just draw up on the device a little bit, hold tension on the rod, just snug, just to the point where the piston's firmly held. Now we'll proceed. First you install your oil ring. The oil ring is made up of three pieces. You have an expander rail and you have two side rails. 
first you have to install the expander. Only, ex only extend it enough so it'll just barely fit over the piston. You do not want to stretch it out of shape. And you just put it right inside the, the ring land for it. Now on the oil expander, you must make sure that the ends do not overlap. Just butt together and stay that way. We start with the bottom of the expander. At that point, taking one finger, we can feed the ring into place. And as the end of the ring comes down over the side of the piston, we want to just make sure that it doesn't scratch the side of the piston. Okay? And now, we have it installed properly because we can move this ring with little effort and nothing's binding. Now we take the next side rail, and we're going to go about 180 degrees from the first rail gas rail ring, and we'll start installing that one in the same manner. And as we feed it in with one hand, we maneuver it around the piston with the other. And as we get to the end, make sure we hold the ring away from the piston so as not to scratch the piston. Okay, now, once again, it should take just very light pressure to move the ring in the piston. And that indicates that everything was installed correctly. Next, we go to the second compression ring, the lower compression ring. Now, in all your upper and lower compression rings, they will be marked by a dot, an arrow. They might actually say top spelled into them. Whatever system that your ring manufacturer used will be noted in their packaging. Follow it carefully. In this case, both our rings go with the little dimple facing up. Now you have two, two methods you can put these on with. You can use your fingers and by grabbing the ring in this manner and spreading them out with your thumbs, you can place the ring on, being careful not to twist it, overstretch it, or scratch aside the piston. Once again, you don't want to twist it, so you have to keep everything straight. You expand it just enough to fit over the piston so it fits freely down the piston without scratching. And you release it into the ring land. The other method you can use, if you want to purchase it, is a ex ring expanding inst installation tool. And it's very simple. You follow the manufacturing instructions, insert the, the ring into the tool, squeeze the handle together, it expands the ring, place it over the piston, and when it lines up with your groove, you release the tool, and the ring is installed. And that's all there is to putting the rings on.